Uh, so I guess I have to explain um, the words here. But I guess I'll actually start by explaining a word that isn't in the title, although I guess it, maybe it could be uh, uh, the notion of a Lefschetz vibration. Um, so everything I'm, I'm talking about here is, um, I guess I should say that it's, it's uh, pretty much all joint work with um, Hisaki Endo and Jeremy uh, Van Horn Morris. Right, so I'm talk I'm, I want to talk about uh, four-dimensional left shots vibrations. So let me um, remind you what those are. So these are, say, smooth maps. From, well, for the moment, I'll think of a closed four manifold and take the target of my vibration to be the two sphere uh, that have the following properties. So, first of all, they should be uh, fiber bundle projections away from finitely many critical points. Furthermore, there should be a kind of a standard local form for the map near these critical points. So near each P, uh, you require that there are um, local uh, complex coordinates that are, well, appropriately oriented. Um, so that the map looks like pi of z1, z2 is z1 squared plus z2 squared. So these are uh, sort of standard quadratic singularities in the, in the, um, in the complex sense. Uh, so I guess maybe I'll say a little more as we go along why uh, you might be looking at these things. But for now, let me just describe how if you have a, you know, given a four manifold and such a map, uh, it gives you kind of a nice description of what the four manifold uh, looks like, at least one, one way to think about what it looks like. Uh, so a Lefschetz vibration gives uh, essentially a concrete description of what this guy looks like. By which I mean essentially a handle decomposition. So, first of all, uh, well, so I should start a picture, I suppose. You think of this, the picture is essentially of a the standard picture for a fiber, fiber bundle. Uh, so this is X and this is S2. And so over a regular point of the a regular value of pi, you have a, a smooth preimage, which is some surface. Uh, so this will be some Riemann surface of some genus. And what you say is that this is a Lefschetz vibration of genus G. So the generic fiber is some surface of genus G. Uh, if you look uh, a little more closely at what this local form tells you, then you see the following. Um, so, so this is one of the critical points. So here, presumably, the, the fiber is, is singular. So this is one of your critical points, P. So near critical point P, well, 
maybe I guess what I want to start off with is uh, let's fix some regular fi fiber. and uh, remove a neighborhood of it. <laughs> okay, so then maybe the picture is slightly more literal. So this is uh, a picture of S2 minus a neighborhood of infinity. So that's now just a disk. And uh, this is now the complement of that neighborhood of the fiber in X. Uh, so now if you uh, think about, so now you can think of, um, if this is now S2 minus a disk, you can just think of this as essentially complex numbers or the a disk in C or something like that. Uh, then let's just maybe pretend that the origin is a regular value. So you have a, a regular fiber here, sigma 0. And uh, now I can write near P. Um, you can think of maybe the, the, just look at what the real part of pi gives you in these in these special coordinates. Uh, well, if you just kind of work it out, I guess it's something like this: if, if z i is x i plus i times y i. Too many i's there. Uh, so in other words, this is a Morse function with an index 2 critical point. Well, so in other words, what you can think about is, um, you know, you've got Here's the origin, which is maybe a, a regular value. So you start with a, a neighborhood of this consisting of regular values. You've got some critical values um, here in the disk somewhere. And you would just imagine this neighborhood that I've drawn here sort of expanding out past each of these critical values. And at each stage, essentially, this, this local model tells you that uh, what you see upstairs as you expand the neighborhood here past a critical fiber is you see just a two handle being attached uh, to the boundary of what you had before. So uh, this gives you um, the following description of X. It looks like this regular fiber, so the neighborhood of that would just be something like this. You, you then add a bunch of two handles. Uh, and then, you, well, since we pulled out a neighborhood of the, another regular fiber, we have this picture. So these are um, two handles. Uh, and so you can you can say a little bit more, I guess, uh, by analyzing the local model a little bit more carefully. You can sort of see what these critical what these two handles are doing. Um, Uh, if you look at the inverse image of a regular value here, you're talking about z1 squared plus z2 squared equals c. This is some degree 2 curve in, in c2, I suppose. So this uh, kind of schematically uh, and so as C kind of approaches the origin, then this curve develops a singularity. So it's sort of schematically this quadric surface looks like you know, this, I guess. And then as C goes to 0, you get some uh, degeneration of that to the intersection of two complex lines. It looks something like this. So this is uh, what you see in particular if you kind of analyze the situation. You, you can sort of explicitly see a circle on the fiber there being pinched to a point as C goes to 0. So a uh, critical point. So this is uh, P here. 
so to, to this P is associated uh, what's called a vanishing cycle. Um, which, uh, that's this thing. I'm afraid to use, what, I'm going to give it a name, but I'm afraid that I'm going to use a letter that I'm going to use later, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so this is on nearby fibers. Uh, and then, and, and the, the point is that, that as C goes to zero, that, psych, that uh, vanishing cycle sweeps out a disk as it contracts, and that, that disk is essentially the two-handle. Uh, and well, so again, if you if you analyze this local model still further, you can determine that. Uh, the, so this is telling you that uh, to get from this guy to this guy, where you've put in the singular fiber, you are attaching a two handle along some circle gamma in one of these fibers, and you can analyze what the framing of that two handle is. Uh, and well, there's a natural framing of this guy given by the fiber itself, if you think of it as lying on the boundary of the neighborhood that you started with. Uh, and it, it turns out the framing of the two nails is one less than that canonical framing. Uh, so this is sort of the fiber framing minus one. OK, so uh, this is the basics of a left chest vibration. Uh, well, so this is, I'm thinking of this uh, as a starting point as being the, the three manifold, which is the boundary of the neighborhood of, say, sigma. This is sigma zero across D2. So the boundary of that uh, is some three manifold. In there, I see some fiber. Uh, and that's where that gamma sits. So gamma sits as a circle in the, in the fiber there. Uh, so the fiber itself, I mean, the, the framing for gamma is just a trivialization of the normal bundle. And the, so the, or in, in other words, a way to push, up, push off gamma from itself. And the fiber provides you a way to do that. So the framing that the two handle is attached with differs from the fiber framing by, by one. And that's, that's what this is supposed to. Does that, does that, make, does that answer your question? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not claiming it's entirely obvious from what I've told you, but uh, it turns out that, you know, I, so I claim that the difference between this three manifold and the outer one is a single two handle. I've tried to convince you that the two handles attached along this circle in the so fiber. That's what you mean, the older number is one different. Well, I mean, the, the framing of a circle in a three manifold is a trivialization of its normal bundle, and there's a there's a z worth of such things, right? It's just, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, so now I can come to one of the words in the title. It's a monodromy. Um, okay, so let's continue to think about the case, you know, just a particular critical point. Uh, so now I'm going to expand, expand my definition of left sets vibration slightly and allow the base to be just a disk, that's sort of what I've been doing already. Uh, and let's just pretend that there's just a single critical value, or one critical point, I guess. So this, the picture is, is this again. You have a single guy here with a singular fiber, say, in the, in the center. Uh, this, so again, this is almost a fiber bundle. In other words, in particular, if I remove the fiber over the origin, then I, I have an honest fiber bundle. Uh, and such a fiber bundle over a punctured disk is determined by its monodromy. So, uh, Uh, 
so what, what do I mean by Bono journaling? Well, the, the idea is that, um, well, as you traverse, say, the boundary circle of this disk, uh, well, first of all, if you, if you cut open the boundary circle itself, you, you see a, a bundle over an interval, which is trivial. Now you're gluing it back up to itself to get a bundle over a circle. And so you're gluing it by some diffeomorphism of the fiber. And that's, that diffeomorphism is the monodromy. Uh, so the, the fact here is uh, in this situation the monodromy is, is a it's so that it's a diffeomorphism of the standard of the fiber of the vibration and it's just a Dane twist. Uh, particularly, it's a Dane twist around this vanishing cycle. Uh, more generally, I guess if you have some picture like this where you've removed some neighborhood of a regular fiber and you look at um, a fibration with a bunch of critical points and the monodromy around the whole boundary will be the composition of Dane twists. Uh, one for each vanishing cycle that you see. Uh, so So if you have more a left chest vibration, that's that's what LF is uh, over a disc. Now with many critical points, say the monodromy around the boundary is uh, the composition of Dane twist. Uh, course around each of the vanishing cycles. So uh, I suppose strictly um, the, the order of these twists sort of matters. Uh, so the idea would be to you know, have a bunch of critical values down here. You, you have to fix some reference fiber, say, over the boundary. I, well, I guess I'll put it here. Uh, so there's your, your reference fiber, and you have to imagine kind of traveling around the boundary of the disk uh, as being a concatenation of traveling around each of the uh, critical points in turn uh, in some order, right? And so then the monodromy would be the kind of combination of the Dane twist in that order. Okay. Uh, so in fact, right, if this, suppose this left chest vibration over the disk came from cutting open a vibration over a sphere in the way I did it a second ago, um, uh, so I'm, I'm calling everything X, but I guess maybe that was bad notation. So if, if this vibration over a disk comes from removing a neighborhood of a regular fiber like this, well, the, then the monodromy around the boundary of this disk has got to be the same as the monodromy around the boundary of the complementary disk. Uh, but the complementary disk is trivial. I kind of removed the neighborhood of a regular fiber. And so that, in other words, the monodromy around that disk has to be trivial. In other words, if you look at the diffeomorphism given by the composition of these Dane twists, it has to give you something isotopic to the identity. So that says my left sets vibration gives you uh, what is now generally called a factorization of the identity. So, 
twist around gamma 1 followed by twists around gamma n. Also, this is the composition of Dane twists that I get by looking at the monodromy around each of the vanishing cycles, but then my, the fact that I've got a vibration over a sphere means that that composition has to be identity again. So uh, in, the, in terms of the, the mapping class group, this composition has to come out to be 1. Is that okay? So uh, keep in mind that, uh, so, okay. The fact is that the left shut's vibration can be reconstructed from that data. In other words, if somebody hands you a factorization of the identity into a composition of Dane twists, uh, then you can rebuild a left shut's vibration basically by reversing the story I just told you, namely uh, start with a neighborhood of a regular fiber, you stick a surface cross disk, and then they tell you a bunch of Dane twists that you want to do. Those just really just correspond to adding these two handles along the corresponding circles. Uh, so you add a bunch of two handles. Uh, the fact that you're factorizing the identity means that after you're done adding the two handles, the monodrome is going to be trivial, so you can fill in the remaining neighborhood of a regular fiber. So in fact, uh, there's kind of a natural correspondence. Uh, between factorizations of the identity in uh, the mapping class group of this fiber. So I don't know how to mapping class group of sigma with uh, left sets vibrations having fiber sigma. Um, and I guess there's some kind of equivalence relations on both sides to make that um, precise, but I don't really want to talk about that. Okay, so far? Okay, so uh, I want to get to the substitutions part of the title. So here so far I've been talking about um, what you might think about as relations in the mapping class group. In other words, it's kind of a combination of generators whose, whose product is one. Uh, but there are, you can look at relations of a slightly different sort. Uh, so this is the substitutions. Suppose you have a, a relation in the mapping class groups that relates one product of Dane twists to another product of Dane twists. So the kind of the classical example of this is uh, the following relation on a uh, disk with three holes in it. So a disk with three holes looks something like this. Uh, the, this is what's called the lantern relation. And it says that if you, so this is the disk with three holes, if you, what it says is if you do Dane twists around these three circles, or these four circles, uh, that's the same thing as doing Dane twists around these three circles. So uh, if this is um, X, Y, Z, and W, and these are A, B, and C, then uh, if I, if you allow me to conflate a curve with the Dane twist around the curve, this the lantern relation says that x, y, z, w is equal to a, b, c. If you um, interpret the order correctly, which I don't want to think about. Okay. So this is the sort of thing I'm talking about, although I guess strictly for a, for a left chest vibration, I've been talking about the fiber being a closed surface, but uh, and as opposed to something like this, but um, maybe we'll come to that in a minute. 
Uh, okay, so you suppose that you have a relation like this. And uh, if you suppose, um, well, let's just stick with this relation. So x, y, z, and w. And in fact, like, okay, so this is on a, on a three-hole disk, but let's just imagine that this three-hole disk is some subsurface of my, of my fiber. So just take... Okay, and just let's just imagine that that's some piece of the, the of the fiber. Right? So I have this relation. Uh, so now let's say I have a left shut vibration, and so it's described by some factorization like this. So it's got some monodromy word, which is this uh, product of Dane twists, and it's described by this relation, or this factorization. And uh, so let's just pretend that M has these X, Y, Z's, and W's in it. Or so it's X, Y, Z, W times some M prime. So M is, M is a product of a bunch of twists, and let's just suppose that four of the twists are those guys. Okay, then the left shot vibration tells you that this product is equal to 1. The Lenantian relation says that x, y, z, w equals a, b, c. Then if you just substitute you see that a, b, c times this whatever is left over, m prime, is also equal to 1. So you have a new factorization of the identity. Uh, and therefore, you, you get a new left shut vibration. X prime. Yeah? It's a subsurface of the f sigma, which is the fiber of some left shut vibration. So, some high genus surface, I guess. Okay, so this x prime is, uh, I mean, so those products of Dane twist as, as diffeomorphism, these compositions are, are equal or isotopic, but these left shut vibrations are, are different. I mean, for example, right, I know that. This is the two, right? The yes. Right. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, as four manifolds, these are definitely different. Like, I mean, I described to you how the, the factorization gives rise to a handle, comp handle decomposition for x. You start with sigma cross a disk, add a two handle for each Dane twist, and then you cap off with surface cross disk. And this just has different number of two handles in it, right? So that these two guys will have different Euler characteristics, for example. It's kind of totally they're different. Um, so you could ask. Uh, what did you do? I mean, how, what's the geometric interpretation of this substitution? So you mean, as an element of metric class for sigma, that relation to a double is equivalent to a b c, right? Yeah, I just say that the diffeomorphism given by composing those four Dane twists is isotopic to the diffeomorphism given by this composition of three Dane twists. But, but when you when you have that set vibration as a model description, First one, first one is not equivalent to the second one. Right. Remember, what matters for the describing a left shot vibration is not the actual what the diffeomorphism is, but the actual list of Dane twists that you write. So it's not the it's not the fact that you know it's not the product of these things that matters. Although you know it always has to be one. What matters is is the actual sequence of Dane twists. Once you once you have a sequence of Dane twists, you write down a handle structure for the for the four manifold and it, and it builds the four manifold back up. So it, you, it might be better to think of the left vibration as described by uh, an ordered list of simple closed curves, what, which are required to have the property that the composition of Dane twists along them is, is isotopic the identity. But now, so now what I'm saying is, given one such list where four of the curves are x, y, z, and w, I can produce another such list replacing x, y, z, and w by a, b, and c. So that list will be one shorter than the previous list. 
a describable different form manifold. So, but Xn X prime is diffeomorphic, or no? No, they have different Euler characteristics. Exactly, yes. So the observation, this is due to Endo and Goethe's. Is that uh, if you do this procedure, let's so if x and x prime above. So this is the original left side separation x, I guess, described by. Uh, so these are just as smooth manifolds now uh, are related by uh, a rational blowdown. along a sphere of square minus 4. So um, now I have to tell you what rational blowdown means. I guess the basic idea is best summarized uh, in terms of an ordinary blowdown. Uh, suppose you have a four manifold and it contains a sphere uh, with self intersection minus one, so that. So a sphere S or something. Uh, this means that right, its, it's normal bundle has degree minus one as a, as a disk bundle over the sphere. Um, then if you look at a neighborhood of this guy and you look at the boundary of it, uh, it's, I guess, a basic example in first year topology that this is just S3. So if you remove the neighborhood of, so this is the neighborhood of S. If you remove the neighborhood of S, so here's, here's my X, there's an S in it, and around here there's S3. There's too many S's here, but sorry about that. If I just cut this out, I can then fill in the, the complement by a ball. Uh, so it's it's x minus the neighborhood of this sphere of square minus t one, uh, with a uh, four ball filled in in its place. So it, it just erases this kind of essential sphere and, and just uh, you know kills it. And that um, well, you think of it as contracting the sphere. So a rational blowdown is a similar construction. Uh, where you look for spheres or configurations of spheres where the boundary of their neighborhood maybe isn't S3 but is some other three manifold that bounds, well, not B4, but somebody with the rational homology of B4. So this, I mean, general uh, idea, I guess, and at least the name is due to finish one's turn. Uh, And the, and the applications, uh, kind of the initial applications, are due to them. So we could find configurations of spheres whose boundary y, well, sorry, I mean the boundary of the neighborhood.
also bounds uh, some four manifold Q, which is a homology ball. Then you could do a similar operation, right? You could cut out that configuration, replace it by this Q, and you uh, have changed your four manifold and uh, made it simpler in some way, I guess. You, at least you've certainly reduced the second homology when you do this. And this, so this technique has found a lot of application in, in the last few years or so uh, in constructing exotic smooth structures on four manifolds. Uh, So for example, I can sort of describe to you what some of these configurations look like. Uh, these all take the form of plumbings. Uh, of spheres, or I guess disk bundles over spheres. So I'm going to draw the uh, plumbing graph, I guess. Uh, so I maybe draw it and, and kind of explain what this is supposed to mean. So again, so each vertex um, is supposed to correspond to a disk bundle over S2 whose Euler number is given by the label here. And, a, and an edge between two vertices is put, is, means that you plumb the two disk bundles. Which I'll just kind of indicate schematically like this. You have, here's one sphere with its disk bundle. Uh, you know, it has fibers like so. Here's another sphere with its disk bundle and its fibers look like this. And so you match fiber and section in a trivializing neighborhood here. This is, this, that's what I mean by a plumbing. Okay, uh, so I guess uh, that's sort of a classical fact that, uh, so first of all, the boundary of the neighborhood of this thing is an exercise in Kirby calculus to figure out what that looks like, I guess. So let me call this configuration uh, C sub P. Uh, the boundary of that guy is a lens space p squared p minus 1, and that also bounds a, a rational ball. This is a fact, I guess, I think that Kasson and Haar were the ones that first noticed this. I don't know. At least it certainly appears in their paper. So the point is that anytime you have a four manifold and you can find this collection of spheres in it with these Euler numbers and intersecting in the way it's described by that graph, then you can just cut out the whole thing and replace it by a rational homology ball. Uh, and you have some new four manifold that might have interesting properties. Uh, in the original observation? Um, well, so first of all, minus 4 is the case where p equals 2 in this example. Uh, and all I'm saying is that a sphere of self-intersection minus 4 has a neighborhood whose boundary is a lens space L41, uh, and L41 bounds a rational homology ball. And so the observation was that the substitution technique that, or this substitution operation that I described to you, the relationship between the two four manifolds you get is this rational blowdown along that particular kind of sphere. In other words, if you have a Leschet's vibration where you see the x, y, z, w in its factorization, then there is a minus four sphere in it. And if you replace x, y, z, w by a, b, c, then the difference, is between those, the difference between those two four manifolds is that you just performed exactly this rational blowdown operation. Okay. Okay. So again, you uh, so 
the ver vertices of these graphs, each vertex represents a disk bundle over S2. And an edge means that I want to arrange for those, the cores of those disk bundles to intersect, uh, and, and positively. So <clears throat> I take, you know, here's, here's a disk bundle over S2. Here's another disk bundle over S2. Let me draw it the other way, I guess. This has some fibers. So I just uh, pick some point on each S2, and in the neighborhood of that point, I can trivialize the bundle. So it looks like a neighborhood of the point is D2, and the fiber is D2, so each neighborhood looks like D2 cross D2. And I just identify them by exchanging fibers and sections. Okay. Okay. So this observation, uh, well, okay, so this observation combined with the fact that, you know, minus four sphere is the first case of these kind of family of rational blowdowns suggests that you perhaps maybe could ask for fancier relations than the lantern relation that would give rise to rational blowdowns along these other configurations. So the question is, are there relations in some mapping class group that give rise to rational blowdowns along these other configurations. Um, and the answer is Definitely yes. Uh, in fact, it's um, even more so, I guess. Uh, so there's, I guess, the theorem, which is Endo and Van Horn Morris. Uh, myself, uh, and it says that I guess there are infinite families of relations uh, that all happen to be in the mapping class group of planar surfaces, of which the disk with three holes is a basic example. So, planar surface is just a disk with a bunch of holes. Corresponding substitution relations uh, correspond to rational blowdowns. along well, certainly these CPs, then there are kind of some more general things here. So linear chains of the following form. So these will be numbers B1, B2, up to B sub N or something, where uh, these guys, B1 through Bn, is a continued fraction coefficients for um, fractions of the form p squared over pq minus one. This is what this is the example. Uh, is, this is Finishel and Stern's original notion of a rational blowdown involved this configuration. This is what is typically called a generalized rational blowdown. Um, so there's those guys.
there are graphs in what uh, have come to be called the family W, which looks like this. So I have to It turns out that the boundary of these guys of a plumbing like this also bounds a rational ball, and you can do a rational blow down along a graph that looks like this. Uh, and we have a relation that corresponds to that. Uh, and then there's another that uh, is uh, called the N family, which I'm told the N stands for new. Uh, but anyway, it looks like. Something like this. So these are these two are each uh, sort of triply infinite families. Uh, okay, so p minus one here, uh, q there, and r here. Okay, so there's um, loads of these relations. Uh, so, uh, let's see. These are all, uh, yeah, non-negative integers, I guess, in each case. Uh, I guess in the case where p equals 0, there's some special form that this graph takes that I haven't told you. But, uh, So I guess I believe that the fact that um, you know this 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 example I think was known to Kasson are these two the fact that they bound um, rational balls I guess is something that Jonathan Wall knew um, some time ago uh, they've also come up in in uh, recent work of Stipschitz, Abel, and Wall and I guess that's where the name arises W and N. Um, okay, so maybe I should um, tell you a little bit about the proof. And to do that, um, maybe I'll go back to the original case of a lantern relation and try to describe why what you get um, gives you a, a minus four sphere. Uh, So if I, let's just look at this uh, picture described by this uh, diagram here. So again, this is supposed to be a left chest vibration over a disk. And, and uh, again, I said how you, okay, you, let's think of this disk with three holes as a subsurface of some larger fiber. But in fact, the proof is entirely local. I could just ignore the rest of the fiber and just look at the left chest vibration whose fiber is this three-hole disk uh, and can s just figure out what this guy looks like. Uh, because really, smoothly, all I'm doing when I substitute this picture for the other picture in the relation is, uh, you know, I've, I've got some large vibration here, but there's, there's some piece of the fiber that looks like a three-hole disk. Uh, and so there's some subset of the fiber corresponding to that that three-hole disk where those four curves live. And all I'm doing is cutting out that piece and replacing it by some other piece. With so there, in this case, there are four uh, singular points in here that correspond to those four vanishing cycles. And all I'm really doing is replacing that picture by some picture where, you know, instead I have 
three vanishing cycles that correspond to the A, B, and C. Uh, so all, all I really need to do is analyze what this piece looks like versus what that piece looks like. Oh. So if I just look at what that is, um, how do you construct the four manifold that comes from this? Well, you start with uh, fiber cross D2. So think of that as sort of a, a little portion of this guy here. So this fiber cross D2, um, maybe I'll, let's call this well, four-hole disk. They call it F. So distinguish it from the entire fiber sigma. Uh, so this is an F cross D2. And then I add four two handles to that guy, correspond one to each of these um, yellow circles. So this whole thing is F cross D2 union four two handles. Uh, well, you can, I mean, you can almost see the minus, you can, you can see the minus four spheres sitting in this picture. Uh, namely, I mean, what are we, what are we really doing? If you really take, take this sort of literally, this is a fiber in the vibration, and I'm gluing two handles, one to each of the yellow circles, and they have relative self-intersection number minus one. This is what the framing equaling the page, page framing minus one tells you that if I think about a disc glued onto this yellow circle, then it's, uh, if I kind of push the yellow circle off itself, you know, so that it misses, then the disc actually will have to have a self-intersection uh, somewhere in the handle. So this, if I look at this sort of subset of the picture, then the, the cores of the handles cap that guy off into a sphere, but the sphere is going to have self-intersection minus four, one, one copy of minus one for each of the handles that I glued on. Is it, do you see what I'm saying? Anyway, whether you do or not, I can give you another proof. So this, this disk caps off to a minus four sphere. So you can just, you can just sort of see it in the picture, uh, at least with practice. Um, and well, okay, I can give you uh, maybe a more honest proof that, that this left shot vibration describes the neighborhood of a minus four sphere um, by drawing a Kirby diagram for that guy, which um, maybe not everybody is familiar with. But if, for example, what does F cross D2 look like? Well, F is a disk minus three, uh, F is a disk minus three smaller disks. So if you think about, okay, take D2 cross D2, which a curvy picture for that is this, uh, and now remove three smaller disks from that. So you remove, so F cross D2 is D2 cross D2 minus three copies of point cross D2. So if you're familiar with Kirby calculus, removing a, a disk from the interior of the four ball can be described in a Kirby picture by putting a, a knot with a dot on it. Uh, so essentially what you see is that when, for each of these punctures, you have an unknot with a dot on it. So in the back of your mind, you imagine that three-hole disk sitting here, and there's a dotted circle corresponding to each of the um, holes. And so these are, should be closed up somehow. Uh, okay, and now I'm adding two handles, one for each of the yellow guys. So I add a two handle around each of these. And I add a big two handle that goes around all of them. And each of them has framing minus one because here I see the, the surface and it's kind of got the obvious framing in this diagram. So the surface framing minus one, it just kind of means framing minus one in the Kirby picture. Um, and now you do some Kirby calculus. Uh, just grab this big circle and start sliding it off these other guys. If you uh, slide this guy off this guy, slide this handle over the small minus one. It uh, slides over, the framing changes to minus two, and it ends up linking that guy. So, looks something like this, I guess. And now this minus one circle goes over that one handle geometrically once, so I can just cancel it. And I do the same thing with this one. Uh, it comes off and links this guy once, has framing minus three, cancel that, and then do the same thing, and I get minus four. 
And that's the curvy picture for a disk bundle of degree minus 4. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that's, that tells you that this side is a neighborhood of a minus 4 sphere. So somewhere in here is a minus 4 sphere. Uh, the, the fact that the other side is a rational ball, I mean, you could be curious whether the rational ball you get from this picture is the same as the rational ball that Karen has, Kasson and Hare came up with. Um, and to do that, you could just do the same sort of Kirby calculus. But if you, all you care about is that it is a rational ball, all you have to do is sort of look at this diagram and think about where its homology comes from. It's, I mean, what's the homology of the four manifold described by this picture? It's, well, it's, it's got uh, kind of one cells corresponding to the, the fiber here and then two cells corresponding to the yellow circles. These kind of cap them off. In other words, I have three generators corresponding to the homology of the fiber and three relations that correspond to the yellow circles and rationally the relations kill the generators and that's kind of it. Okay, so that's uh, that's the proof that this is a rational blowdown. Um, I guess maybe in the last minute, I'll try to show you, for example, maybe why one of those basic W families comes out of this. So how does that idea of proof idea of this proof of Well, I'm about to show you. So there's a key lemma that connects the two. <laughs> So yeah. So what I'm going to do is, is write down a, a new re a relation in a plane in the mapping class group of a planar surface, uh, and this idea will tell you that that relation describes the rational blowdown of one of these graphs. That's that's what I mean. Uh, so so the key lemma is the following. Suppose you have, uh, suppose I want to try to build up relations inductively. So suppose you have a relation uh, so I'm not sure what the best way to say what I'm trying to say here is, but uh, you have a relation that involves the following picture. You have some surface. It has a couple of punctures in it, or a couple of holes in it. And one side of the relation involves twists around the holes, and the other side of the relation involves a twist around a circle and closing the two holes. Uh, so, I mean, a basic example of this is the Lantern relation um, where I have several instances of this situation. For example, any, you know, these two guys, or maybe those two guys, uh, kind of have this property. That one side of the relation involves a twist around the boundaries, and the other side of the relation involves a twist around a circle that closes the two. Then I claim that there's a new relation on a different surface. you split one of these holes into two. So instead of having a surface where there are two holes corresponding to this, you would have one where there's one additional puncture. Uh, make sure I don't forget any circles. Where um, you have twists around each of these, you have additional twists around that one. And this guy involves two, like so. So you can sort of split this sort of finger into two uh, at the expense of adding another twist around one of the boundary guys like that. Uh, so the, the proof of this is uh, very easy. If you, um, if you take this guy that I claimed was going to be related to the other guy and just apply this relation to it. So the idea is, okay, if I had a twist around uh, that dotted circle, then I could apply that relation and obtain the following. So just 
pretend that there was a twist here. These, these two things would be unaffected by the relation, but, and this one would now uh, look something like this. Oops, I use yellow. Um, but I, I needed a twist here, so I can sort of borrow one. Uh, I'll put a red curve to indicate that I uh, am doing an the inverse of a Dane twist there. So I guess I've always been talking about right-handed Dane twists. The yellow curves mean do a right-handed Dane twist around the curve. The red curve means do a left-handed Dane twist. Uh, uh, I want to leave it there. Yes. Do, do you believe this? So this is what would follow from the, rela the relation that I was given. It would give me something like this. Uh, is, is that right? Uh, sorry. Wouldn't give me this. It would, it would do this, right? There. Introduce a, a yellow and a red curve that cancel each other. And then the outer yellow curve, together with one of those curves, with this relation, becomes this, this guy. Okay, but now I still have that red curve sitting there. Okay. But now, the lantern relation tells me that the four yellow curves here are isotopic. So the lantern relation, uh, I'm going to start drawing holes as dots because it's faster. Um, lantern relation gives you this. And now if I just apply what I was just given, I get somebody on a, let's say I want to split uh, one of these guys into two. Then what I see is I'm supposed to put um, an additional twist around the guy that I didn't split. New twists around those. Leave the what's left over. Sorry. Uh, and I still had a twist around the edge. And that splits this uh, guy here into two like so. The remaining curves sort of stay the same. This is, okay, now I'll do the same thing. I'm going to split this guy. So uh, there's an easy generalization of this lemma that allows the same thing to happen if there's a bunch of holes up here. Just it looks exactly the same with, uh, well, almost looks exactly the same. I'll leave it as an exercise. So I can split the one down there. I'll have these two holes, one near, two there. Uh, some of this stuff stays the same. So there were two here. The way the exercise turns out is you need to introduce a new twist like this. Uh, these are still there. And now this one is still the same. And now the one that goes this way is split into two. So I have this picture. This picture. This just gets um, increasingly ugly as we go, um, but somehow it's very symmetrical. And then finally, you do the same thing uh, across the bottom. Strictly speaking, I should be paying attention to the order of everything that happens here, but um, doing so would detract entirely from the presentation, so I'm not going to do that. So what is the board of these people? What is the final destination of the the, well, the final destination is the following picture. <laughs> All I'm saying is that, okay, so I can get a picture like this. You can only understand this picture as you're drawing it. You can never understand the end result. <laughs> uh, right, so now let's stop. Uh, and what do you see? Uh, well, I want to try to convince you that this is a plumbing. First of all, actually, maybe it's the easiest is to, to ask you to believe that this is, describes a rational ball. And again, it's just because you know there are six punctures here, so there are six generators in H1, six relations in H2, and they span rationally. Uh, so that's a rational ball. This guy is a plumbing. And how do I see that? Well, again, if you tried to 
if you followed what I did before, maybe this will make sense. So if you look at this region here between these guys, that together with the disks that I've glued to the circles will describe a sphere, and it has interse self-intersection equal to the number of yellow circles on the boundary, namely four. So there's a minus four. Uh, now, so that's fine. Now look at uh, one of these other guys. This also gives you a sphere. Apparently it has self-intersection minus three because there are three disks glued to it. it. Furthermore, it intersects the sphere I just drew in one point because they both have a copy of that disk around this um, intermediate yellow circle and that disk intersects itself in one point. Well, so there's, a, there's a, a minus three sphere that intersects the minus four sphere and these are two more of them. And this is the case P equals Q equals zero of the W family. So you can, now you can just keep doing this, just keep splitting them and you'll see that you get the right thing. Uh, I guess I better stop.